Good afternoon. How's everyone? Great. This was a wonderful two day and like amazing organization by the, the event organization, uh, organizers. Thank you, Vinit, as well. Uh, I mean, wonderful conference and thank you for having me. Uh, today I'll be talking about like economy. I mean, most of us are on Facebook. There are probably few of us who, after the Facebook testimony, all the data they're collecting, we probably deleted our account. Uh, I, I'm still on Facebook. I'm okay with Facebook collecting my data, giving me recommendations, help me with my research projects as well, so, which is great. <laughs> so in, in today's world, I mean, there are three things that are very important for marketing, advertising, or pretty much any decision making. Social media, mobile, and data. There's a lot of times we could use data from one platform, one channel, use it for targeting consumers on the other channel, what we call omni-marketing. Right? So what we did similarly for personalities, we looked at the social media data, understood people's personality, and I don't work for Cambridge Analytica, but like I collected <laughs> every single data on consumers, understood what their personalities are, used that data to target them on mobile uh, platform. We found that we can actually improve the conversion rate, improve the recall of consumers by advertising them specific brands on mobile technology if we knew what the customer's behaviors are, right? Not necessarily just the location or retargeting or the past uh, browsing behavior or consumption behavior, but the actual personality. People who are, uh, say for example, more neurotic, emotional, uh, have more emotional sensitivity to the environment, apps gain more click, right? So I mean, it's, the results were pretty fascinating when you take data from one place, take it, to the another platform target consumers, right? The same thing over time when more and more people are using these social networks, mobile uh, platforms, we think their behavior is changing. Over the last two days, I've heard many times that the loyalty is going away. Consumers do comparative shopping a lot, right? But what we found is somewhat different. So consumers are behaviorally less loyal. Right? So what that means is, if I want to buy something, I will go out, look for more options that are out there. Right? I will try to find compared, uh, comparable products or solutions for my organization for me. But attitudinally, because there's so much information out there, I'm going to find the information that's more relevant to actually confirm my bias, confirm my priors. So attitudinally, I'm still very loyal. But the organizations then need to be present online to give me the information that confirms my priors, right? So I mean, you could say, I mean, as an extension, competition is somewhat good, right? Because there's too much competition, consumer goes out there to find an alternative solution, they're gonna find that the existing organization that they've been buying from is great, and they're gonna stick with it. Right? So you need that positive sort of a social uh, op network opinions, the blogs, research studies, et cetera, supporting that the focal organization, your brand, your company is better. So it's more of a, a loyalty needs to be maintained, not gained in one time. Right? <clears throat> so then we said, okay, what does this positivity mean? on a social networking uh, platform, for example. Right? Positivity, does it mean positive sentiments on the comments, more posts, more shares, or more likes? What is actually likes? I mean, there's 1.1 billion monthly active Facebook users generating 4.5 billion likes every single day. Right? That's massive. Likes and share buttons are now viewed on over 10 million websites daily. More and more e-commerce retailers out there are implementing the or Facebook uh, buttons on their platform so they can be engaged, they can have consumers engage with the products on social networking platform, right? <clears throat> Over time, people have said likes actually increase sales because they can reach more consumers. Like also reduce cost because consumer acquisition costs have been rising, likes reduce that consumer acquisition cost. Right? So if we think about like, there's two different ways like can influence the sales. Uh, I mean, that, that I uh, use in this paper. One, I say there's an out of network signal. So when you like a product, say Keds shoes, most of us love the Keds presentation and we think uh, yesterday is like, we're gonna buy a Keds 
shoe, not for like men, but like for my wife or kids or so, right? And I, I have a terrible taste in shoes. I'm going to come to it in a few minutes. But the idea is if there is catch shoes, we like it on a Facebook. Suppose we are connected on Facebook, you might get influenced because of me. But there's also the chance when I like it on Facebook, Keds has a button or an indicator that says there's two people, three people, 100 people like this product, right? So when you go to the page next time, it's a sort of a social endorsement that so many people were actually open to sharing this information in their network out there. So it must be good, right? So there are two parts, again, the influence within the network and out of the network. So effect of like is social influence, which is an active effect, or social signal, which is a passive effect of like, which both lead to product sales. Now, social influence generates sales. We have seen in research can build trust. It has a positive effect. And I mean, it's, uh, people are more twice as likely to click on personalized ad if there is a people associated with the like button. Like, uh, say, for example, Adam, like Ked Shoes, maybe I'm going to be more influenced. Right? <clears throat> and it actually reduces the path to conversion, makes it shorter over time. In terms of social signaling, passive viral messaging is seen to be much more effective. We have seen friends will make you pay. So you don't have to truly have a friend or a person go out there like a product. If on their Facebook page, if you go to, say, Walmart uh, page on Facebook, it says so many of your friends are liking this page. That's a passive signal, which will also make you like the Walmart page or say Ked's page, for example. So that passive signal is very effective. If your uh, consumers are actually giving those passive signals, their network will be influenced even more. You don't have to truly make them like a product or so, right? But I mean, we have all this like data. There, are, there's so much research that says we can use like data to predict an individual's behavior, individual's characteristic, individual's uh, political opinion, their religious inclination, and so forth, right? The paper says people who are smart like curly fries. But it's not truly causal, right? I mean, it's more of a correlation. Do smart people really like curly fries? Like, all smart people will like curly fries? Or it's just maybe. All smart people went to Yale. There was a curly fries uh, shop nearby, and they just loved it, right? And as a result, we see that correlation. So the biggest challenge with social network measurement, uh, estimating ROI, the effect, is homophily or reflection problem, right? Most of you probably have heard of reflection problem or homophily. Reflection problem is, in any social network, when we are connected, we have some similarity, right? Either our actions are correlated, we all attended this Consumer uh, Insights Conference here. As a result, the sales for maybe some product nearby, the Pepe speeds up went up, right? It doesn't mean that, say, Adam influenced me in consuming the Pepe's pizza. It's just we were here. Our actions were correlated. Or our tastes were similar, right? We like pizza, and we look for the, I mean, as a behavior, like we are socially embedded or digitally embedded, we went to Yelp, found the best pizza rated, and as a result, we went there, right? So it could be homophily or some sort of a correlated effect. To address that, we need some experiment, or we need to understand the data much more deeply. So when we look at just the archival data, what we found was two million deals or observations. We found that each like is worth almost 20 cents, where the average price of the product is about $20, where each tweet is worth almost $2, <coughs> right? I mean, these are great numbers. But again, are they causal? Or, I mean, there's some endogeneity in there, right? I mean, we, we've been careful in even running this archival data analysis, but still, we can't be truly causal. We can't be sure. As a result, we need some sort of a field experiment. But when we think about a field experiment where we are picking random products to boost the light, there's a big problem with light. We need to think, remember, that it's relative's game. Relative, not our actual human relative, but like relative is comparing two different products. Now, thinking about these kid shoes, and remember, my taste in kids is very poor. But one of these shoes on Amazon has 305 reviews, 
other has 18. Which one would you pick? Don't look at the shoe, assuming both shoes are equally appealing. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, men most likely will say three under five. Women will think, okay, maybe whichever shoe is more appealing. Uh, and just out of curiosity, uh, is women or most of you will say three under five reviews? No? Okay, the 18. Oh. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so uh, I, I think men. Are, are because the taste is not as refined <laughs> or sophisticated, we may go with some objective information, which is the number of reviews, and we would be wrong. Because the number itself may not be the right indicator, the ratings are. But for a like, all we know is a number. If you don't like something, not like, if you don't like the shoe on the left, you're not actually gonna like it on Facebook. So that social endorsement, the number of likes, essentially is one, it's a relative score. If a product is liked less versus liked more, there's a stronger uh, social endorsement for the product. Yes? Is that the reason Facebook is not having a dislike button? I'm sorry, say that again. Facebook, a dislike button on yeah. Facebook. Uh -huh. At some point there was a discussion about that, that you can dislike something as you like you something. You can. can. And you? we actually, you in, yes you can. So in our study, most people don't know that. How many of you knew you can dislike? Actually, not dislike, unlike. I, I want to be correct, yeah. So you can't, like, thumbs down. You can like and then unlike it. That's, that's, that's not the point. That's, uh, yeah. And so, but that's a point that the, there is a positive value for like. If there is a dislike, then it becomes a rating or a uh, system, right? Here, if you like something truly, then you're gonna click on the like button. Otherwise, you won't. So think of this way. If there is a product you're likely to rate three star, or even say four star, you're not gonna like it on Facebook. If you truly like something, say five star, you're likely to like it on Facebook. And as a result, it's a good signal that the product is maybe good, right? And that's where this question comes in. What is the value of that like then? So if there's so many people who are actually liking the product, is it truly beneficial for the company? Is it generating the extra revenue? <laughs> yes, Sham. Like has two meanings. Yes. One refers to similarity. The other refers to buttons. And this one refers to buttons. Unlikes refers to similarity aspect of it. True, true. What are you, what is your interpretation of what so like here is essentially, it's, it's sort of a combination. It, it's confounding effect in a way, because all I'm saying is like on Facebook. So you are indicating on your social network that you like something. That's preference. That's preference. Not, uh, similarity. Not, just, not a similarity. But unlike, right. as opposite of like, not, not really. Uh, absolutely, but there is no sort of a unlike button on Facebook. The idea is if you like something, you can unlike it so it, your friends won't know that you liked it. Unless, unless there's a catch there. If you like it, your friends commented on it, then you can't unlike it anymore, right? Because whatever goes on internet stays there forever. <laughs> you can't get rid of it, right? <laughs> So, I mean, the great point. So, like is essentially a preference of consumers, which is sort of disclosed on the online setting. And the disclosure is to your personal network as well as the internet population, of the consumers, which is the signal. Right? Now, when we're trying to estimate, I mean, we saw from the archival data, yes, there is an estimate, but now we want to do a field experiment to truly establish the causality. The problem is, again, it's relative, right? Like would work if one shoe has, say, 300 likes versus the other has 10. If we're doing an experiment, either we're boosting or treating a product one time, right? We're saying, okay, I'm gonna introduce, say, 10 likes for a product. Let's see what happens, right? But on Facebook, I mean, remember the Instagram talk yesterday, people have very short attention span, 
they don't go to Facebook one day, you won't see any effect, right? So or do you have to then continuously or over time introduce more treatments? But if you start introducing treatments for multiple products, then overall the relative likes for all products are increasing. So a consumer, I mean, you still have a control group which is not sort of inflated, which is not treated. But then when consumers go to the page and they see maybe other similar products out there with similar likes, maybe it's gonna sort of corrupt their uh, behavior. So you need some sort of a combination of both the uh, continuous uh, treatment and as well as one boost, right? Boost or a shock in the system. Right? So we take in this treatment, in this experiment, the idea is we take two different sort of a treatment, combine them together to estimate the effect of light. We have a uniform distribution from which we draw every single day. We give that draw or the number of likes to our treatment products. Right? Then we also draw from a normal distribution once in the entire month for a random product. Right? And then say, okay, this random product will get a big shock on the, uh, on the likes, right? So if you think about the products, I mean, we have three different categories of product. We have the experiential product. We partnered with uh, a Texas-based retailer with a couple, I mean, some 20 something million in revenue. And they didn't have a Facebook button on their page. So we said, uh, can you introduce a Facebook button on the page? And they did for the treatment products and the control products. Their average price for experienced goods was $30. Now, we didn't pick specifically any uh, gender-specific products, so they were more uh, unisex, gender-neutral hats, scarves, uh, socks, and, and so forth, right? Uh, then we had a soft cash. Uh, I'm not supposed to say uh, name of the company, but something that sounds like coupon, right, kind of thing. <laughs> <laughs> so we collected like massive amount of data for, for those products. We also uh, picked, uh, I'm missing 17 of those products as well. We treated some of those products for these extra two shocks and then a control group which we keep observing, a uh, control group being very, very similar, right? Then we also had mobile apps, a uh, combination of free and paid average price of 50 cents and uh, we basically treated some uh, five uh, apps and we didn't treat the other. Now to in inflate these likes, we recruited 314 uh, students from the University of Texas. We ran the experiment for 28 days. Subjects were paid $10 a week with extra $10 bonus if they participated in all four days, four, four weeks. We had 65% female, which is little more than the number of female uh, on Facebook, which I actually learned from uh, up on a slide this morning, which was the Facebook representative population is 58% female. But uh, we had a little bit more than that. We had 68% uh, people using iPhones, 30% Android, 1% Windows, 1% other mobile devices. And then the average number of friends for these people was 194. Now think about the data. So we actually built an app like Cambridge Analytica, which collected every single piece of data on the consumers. We had every single access to every single post, comment, like, uh, video, every single thing. We had access, we didn't collect everything. I'm, I'm just saying, so I mean, if you have an app, <laughs> you can collect everything, but we were under IRB and everything, so it's like, we're gonna focus our data collection to only the links that are of uh, value to us, right? So, but, I mean, we didn't uh, do this without their consent. They approved, they said, okay, yes, you can collect our data for these 30 days, and after that, they were free to delete the app from their Facebook account, right? What we tracked was uh, people had 93,000 likes. So, I'm like, if, you have, if you're watching a video on Facebook, I'm not saying they were creating 93,000 likes, but like, if a video is there, the video may already have 90,000 likes. So on an average, there were 93,000 likes, 15,000 shares of the links, pictures, videos, et cetera. There were 13,000 comments, and there were total uh, 197 social touch points, right? Uh, like, share, uh, comment, combination, right? And if you look at the aggregate total number, like these are uh, average across all links that were shared by these people. 
right? But if you look at the aggregate number of the likes uh, and share and comments that is basically shared by these people, the 314 people only, there were two billion touch points every single day. It's massive, right? <clears throat> and there were 6,800 touch points for our products, the treatment and control group products, right? So we had total 76 products. We divided into 46 treatment, 30 control. Within 46 treatment, we had 19 experience goods, 17 uh, soft good cash, 10 software good. We had uh, for control, 10 experience, 10 soft cash, and 10 mobile apps, right? For the treatment, we gave a small shock every single day. We gave a large random shock on one day in a month. And then also at a random time during the month, we told the consumers, people, that you can unlike, right? So when you, you have subjects in a study, most of the time they think they have to like, but they cannot unlike to get paid, right? But uh, sometime like after the study, we picked at a random time, only for uh, I mean, half of the people, 150 people, and we said, okay, you can unlike as well, to see if unliking changes the outcome. And interestingly, we didn't find any significant result on a negative effect of unliking. Once a person likes, there are very few people that actually unlike. There was only 2% of the links that were unliked uh, in that uh, study time period, and has no significant uh, statistical significant result. Anyway, so this was the distribution of our likes for each of the, the, the products and across different days, right? So sort of a surface graph, and the spikes you see is the large shock. And the, the surface here is the random shock given any single day for any given product. <laughs> Very simple empirical specification. I had some theoretical model. I got rid of it. Uh, so what we found, again here, interestingly, that by treating the products we're generating, by having the Facebook engagement, by maybe manipulating the likes, by having people like our products, we're generating $48 extra. Every single like is, again, almost 19 cents. And it's interesting and surprising, and I'm not sure why, uh, archival data suggested 20 cents per minute, uh, sorry, per uh, like. Uh, the experiment suggested 19 cents uh, per like, which is very similar. I'm still, still trying to figure out in the data how could it be so close, right? But there has to be something else going on. In addition, we found the social influence part. So, I mean, the like here is the social signal part, right? This is 19 cents generated just because you had more likes on the web page. But there is a $2.45 per day generated from the social influence itself. So when I'm liking a product, Adam buys this, who's connected to me in the network, as a result, there's a $2.4 sales. Now, remember, the average price of the product is between $20 and $30. Now, we're also ignoring mobile apps in here because mobile apps had no significant result uh, or uh, return on investment. Because like half of the apps were free, half were like a dollar app, but people, I mean, there were so many choices, it didn't convert to much sales. So we said, okay, now let's think about the large shock. So we, we observe this is what happens with the like. Now we are creating such a large shock into these apps, and we found they generate 1.3 extra sales, almost $40 in extra sales by creating that one extra shock, which is extra 100 likes, right? But it's very short-lived. You generate that sale for one day after creating the shock. The second day, the effect goes away. Right? So I mean, that tells the sort of the small uh, attention span of people. If they see a like, uh, they're gonna buy it right now. Maybe in future, they don't care as much. Or because the relativity, uh, I mean the relative scoring, they're gonna look at the highest uh, likes one day, they'll buy it, but tomorrow, maybe some other product has a high like. As a result, the sales didn't influence uh, as much. Right? So that's why we have to, for sort of a Facebook study, we have to consider the relative component, and uh, the effect is only lasting for one day. Right? Considering the, the large shock, again, social influence did play a significant role, and uh, very similar to what we found uh, previously without the shock. 
So, I mean, there are a whole lot of limitations as well. I mean, like, no research study comes with absence of limitation slide, as you saw. So, mobile apps didn't have any significant result. Likes are relative signals with no absolute measurement. They're not star ratings. It works for platform with few likes. So, what we tested is for a platform where, where they had zero or single digit or double digit likes, or for the soft goods which had maybe double or triple digit likes, but not in thousands. Right, but you go to some platforms, there's so many likes out there. Will this result be generalizable? I don't know, right? I mean, maybe it's just the percentage of likes that you are creating. Eventually, and you probably have already seen, because people find value in likes, over time there's link uh, liking scam happening. There are companies that are giving you or selling you the number of likes. There are companies that are paying you to like multiple products as well. Right? So that is going to, over, over time, reduce the value of the likes as well. Right? <clears throat> and also, I mean, the long, yes? I just have a question. Uh, right, I mean, on Facebook, they have likes and they have other emojis that you can do as well. Were you able to isolate that? Are you kind of all its likes? Or was it just the So um, when we did the study, this is 2014. Uh, so it wasn't there at that time. But great question. Um, so the, finally, the limitation is the long-term effect versus short-term effect. Like there's a research that shows if you inflate the like, maybe you'll get some sales in the short term, but over time, the, the likes for other products is gonna evolve and it'll be basically more of an organic relative scoring, right? So maybe that'll work with the, the products uh, on Facebook as well. So we were actually, we weren't using ads to generate likes. We were using actual humans, like paying them money, like, hey, like this. Yeah. But we did do an expert a study with uh, ads. And we, so basically the next question was, likes work. Now, should you all basically create like on one platform, one group, advertise on one group, maybe you should sequence. So what we found in this, that if you sequence the ads first to a smaller group, then to a larger group, it actually gives you better ROI than if you target small to small, large to small, or large to large. And the reason is because you, there's so much information being generated out there. If you are a small group like here, you're paying more attention. You, whatever information is coming at you, you're paying more attention. Whereas if you're in a larger group, you're consuming or you're recalling or retaining much less information. But and word of mouth or spillover happens, as a result, small to large effect is much larger. Then we said, okay, what if our products are viral? We have kids like shoe, which are so popular, then can we boost the sales even further? And the idea is yes, if you actually go to alternative platforms. Right, and then you can optimize the timing. So if you have a viral product, a very successful product, you launch into other markets at day 27, at day 48, which is gonna boost your sales the most. Right, I mean, and this worked for some video content, but I mean, you, you can come up with the similar numbers for different kind of products as well. But then, I mean, this is all experimental. Can we do this with data? And the answer is yes. Can we address the reflection problem? Can we address homophily? With the data, answer is yes. So a sort of a quasi-experimental approach uh, that you can do to basically, most of these studies are trying to screen in the information, screen in the influence. I mean, here we are saying you screen out whatever looks susceptible, right? So as a result, you may have more cleaner uh, influence uh, outcome or measure. So in conclusion, social presence is economically valuable. You need to enable Facebook like button on products and article pages. Both social signaling and influence components of a like are significant drivers of sales. And you need a periodic burst or marketing effort to boost the sales or social signal, right? Burst advertising has large effect in the setting with especially low, low number of likes, but for a short time. With that, um, thank you. <laughs> Thank you.